Good morning, everybody. Uh, this session is about to start. Thank you. My name is Jared Craddock. I'm the chair for the next one and a half hours. So what I would like, uh, we feel a bit lonely up here. People down the back, hello. Can you see us up here? We can see you. Any chance of coming up and talking to us up here near the front? We have some surprises and prizes for uh, the most attentive and the best questions this morning. So universal design is all about participation. So we're looking for loads of participation from the audience here today. So uh, my name is Ger Craddock. As I said, I head up the Centre for Universal Design in Ireland, which is the only centre that has been funded by government uh, in the world. So we're quite unique. So what is universal design? So quickly, it is defined within the United Nations Convention for the Rights of People with Disabilities, also within Irish legislation. Universal design, design and composition. And I think people forget, the, they forget that second word. It is about design. How do we do good design? Uh, it's about the environment and the wider environment. It is about how do we access, understand and use and to the greatest extent possible. In Ireland, we talk specifically looking at age, size, ability and disability. That is not within the UN Convention definition. A key world document by the World Health Organization talk about the paradigm shift, moving from accessibility, which is about access and usability of facilities for people with disabilities, to a universal design, which talks about enabling independent social participation for all, and it's about continual improvement. I think a, a landmark document by the World Health Organization in 2011. Steve Jobs, um, Apple, talks about design is not just how it looks or how it feels, design is how it actually works. Key ingredients from an Irish perspective, we talk about understanding difference, and I think we heard great speeches here this morning celebrating and trying to understand difference. We are constantly educating ourselves. One of the reasons we come to these conferences is meeting people, engaging, understanding difference. It is about people, people-centered. It is based on seven principles. It is about a process. A lot of people think, well, well, universal design, we just design it and then it's over. It is about initiative, it is ongoing, and you'll hear some great presentations here this morning. It is about multi-stakeholder participation, and it is looking at it from a broader systems perspective. I like this cartoon, which I think summarizes what is universal design, and I think very apt with snow outside. We don't see too much snow in Ireland. Uh, so here is the, the person who is shoveling the snow uh, from the steps in a school, and the kid in the wheelchair says, uh, any chance of actually doing the ramp? I said, no, 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 I have to do the steps. And the child says, if we do the ramp, everybody can get into the school. So that is, I suppose, in, in one cartoon, what is universal design? How do we all access the same building, the same service, same technology, without any adaptions, if at all possible? Again, just if we follow regulations, sometimes this is a house, I won't say in which country, and by following regulations, this is what the actual local authority delivered. It is very accessible, but th that is not very pretty. And a sign at the bottom says, please, uh, uh, no teenagers use this as a skateboarding ramp, please. So the, this co cost over 40,000 sterling. Sorry, I shouldn't have said sterling. Uh, but again, this is not what we're looking for. I think this is a bit more what we're looking for. Great design, this is actually half the price of what you get as your standard, which is known as a flat pack, the previous example. Again, the seven principles, which I think most people have heard of, uh, which we have looked at extensively for the last 11 years, and they still hold very true. Again, I think we would add uh, an eighth, which is about beauty. It is that 
the technology, the environment has to be beautiful. Um, again, we talk about it as a process, and we like the 4D model, which is about discovery, it is about defining, then it is developing solutions, and finally delivering. And we talk about stakeholders, we look at them in four broad categories around the public, government, education bodies, and of course industry being very important. Again, a systems thinking, you have to look at it, it's not just a set of guidelines, it's not just a standard, it is about quality assurance, it is about developing training and support, and of course, the reason why we're all here is developing champions and meeting new champions and bringing uh, the, the next generation to actually bring this uh, to the next level as we move forward. So just in Ireland, here are some examples of our, uh, we work with the Royal Institute of Architects and here are some of our award winners over the last year and we're very proud we have a, a, a very special award winner here with us today from Ireland from the Central Bank and you'll hear more about that uh, later on. Again, we develop guidelines, uh, this is Building for Everyone which is a whole series, 900 plus pages, divided into 10 booklets. Uh, here are the covers of same, and here are just some examples as showing examples of some of the technical, uh, but also some pictures to demonstrate what are we talking about when we look at designing the environment. We look specifically at homes, which is critical, but also looking at a whole area of dementia, which is a huge area. How do we uh, look after our uh, lo loved ones that they can stay in their own homes longer, but also how to facilitate with both the the, the daughter who's looking after uh, the mother or father, but also the siblings, the carers as part of that. These are all free available on our website. And uh, here's a national standard we developed in the whole area of tourism. And uh, we were very fortunate in 2016 uh, to be here and um, Ambassador Galeas uh, in the photograph uh, presenting us with our award uh, here in 2016. So very proud of that and uh, anyone who receives the award tonight, congratulations on that. And finally, uh, we're inviting you to Dublin uh, for Halloween uh, 2018. Please bring your fancy dress outfit, otherwise you will not get through the airport security. And uh, it is looking at universal design, but also combining it with a conference looking at the whole area of further and higher education. So welcome all to Dublin uh, in, and can talk to me later. Uh, the website is there for people to follow on. So on that note, uh, just to give you an overview, some thoughts there on what is universal design. And I think we're going to hear great examples uh, following on in just a moment. So, uh, swiftly moving to our first speaker here is Anne-Marie Sabon, uh, who is from Oslo, representing Norway here today. So we have a multicultural, multi-country uh, representation on our uh, panel here today. So, uh, Anne-Marie was the first appointed health and social ombudsperson in Oslo, and Director of the Norwegian Directorate for Children, Youth and Family Affairs, which we have very close relationships with and uh, who are a key partner with us in this Congress coming up in Dublin uh, in 2018. And a former Mayor of Oslo. Uh, she has also uh, lots of experience regarding the UN and the Convention on Rights of People with Disabilities. So without further ado, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, the city of Oslo is uh, the municipal and the capital of Norway. It has about 660,000 inhabitants, so it's not all that big. But it's quite challenging because it's lots of hills, it's fjords, and the cartoon you just showed about snow is in fact an actual discussion at the moment in the city of Oslo. Um, the city of Oslo adopted the common principles of universal design as they are here today in 2014. Those who are interested in the pamphlet itself might contact our two colleagues and you will have them later on. They will be more comprehensive than I can talk about. 
What is special with uh, the common principle of, in uh, Oslo is, of course, that they build on the national legislation. They build on the Norwegian Act relating to equality and prohibition against discrimination for everybody. It's uh, the Planning and Building Act, which is quite, quite clear on, on universal design, and it builds on the CRPD, it builds on, uh, and the City Council has just reiterated that CRPD should be leading for the City Council's policy in Oslo. And it leans on the Sustainable Development Goals and on the requirement of Habitat 3, which is important. The goals, the overall goals for the, uh, for the strategy is that Oslo should be universally designed by the end of 2025. And just to say it straight, we have a way to go. In, and the ICT should be inclusive by 2021. The common principles are comprehensive. That means there are lots of stakeholders and all agencies, relevant agencies in Oslo should have a strategy. Um, the essence of the strategy, which is important, is that the decision is made by the City Council of Oslo. That involves the politicians. The politicians have to uh, decide which, uh, strat uh, which, um, uh, how to, to, to develop the strategy, and most important of all, they have to monitor it. They have to monitor it every single year through the annual reports from all the stakeholders and agencies. Another important thing is that the disabled people's organizations, other NGOs and the civil society has been involved in making the plan. By making the plan, there were lots of groups throughout the city that came up with the solutions and, and the suggestions which some of them were taken into the plan and others not. But this, there could be no plan without um, commitment, both from the civil society and from the administration in the entities. The um, idea with, the, um, uh, with the, the strategy is, of course, that it is comprehensive. It's not just for one entity, it's not just for one structure, but it's for the whole city, which is quite challenges. Uh, it involves a network of employees. They exchange uh, experience and knowledge, as well as run courses and seminars for employees and other stakeholders. Um, as we know, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the universal design, it is not a, a universally known. Very few people, in fact, know what universal design is. Uh, included those who we count on, architects and uh, engineers. Even if it's uh, much better, it's important to, uh, to, to inform better. Uh, the strategy is, of course, helped by the Norwegian law, and uh, also the public sector has an obligation to include universal design in their uh, work, which means that there must also be cooperation between the city council and the, um, the private sectors. This is an example of a, a state entity, in fact, but situated in Oslo, which is absolutely uh, universally designed, the new Opera building in Oslo. So those of you who go there can even walk on the floor, uh, if you, on the roof if you want to. Um, the city of Oslo is... Um, the, the people are very happy when they can go swimming and bathing, so we have lots of uh, things like this, where you can go straight into the fjord, even if it's uh, like 18 degrees, and swim if you want. It's inclusive design. The official city webpa webpage is providing information to the public, and it is, I would say, all over, almost accessible. It's audible, the, the, the letters are good, 
and, uh, and you can use it if you are weak sighted or if you are blind. And it's important because we have lots of information on the website. The Tower of Oslo is another example. Uh, the Tower of, Tower of Stovner, where you can uh, use uh, wheelchair to get the same view as everybody else. We are very, uh, we are, we like very much to go in the, in the nature. Uh, Oslo is an age-friendly city, and this is an example that uh, also people, elderly people, should use the city. They should be able to live in their houses for a long time. Uh, as long as they want, and they should be able to use the cultural activities and everything else they would have. Uh, playgrounds is, a success, is also important, and an age-friendly city means that it also should be accessible for children. So we have playgrounds uh, accessible for children, and new playgrounds built is, should be accessible. As I said, one of the success factors is uh, political dedication. And it's the NGOs and DPOs participation. You have to have strong DPOs to be able to see to it that the strategies are followed. You have to have DPOs and Council on Disabilities who really are monitoring and taking part in the revisions of the strategies. Uh, there is um, the strategy plans in all agencies. In the future, I think the organizations of persons with disabilities and the Council on Disability will monitor them better and more active and harder. Because if we are going to reach this plan within 2025, there is a lot of things which have to be done. Another thing is the realistic budgeting. And, and this year we had, because of the working of the organizations and the um, uh, Council on Disability, we had, I think, about three million uh, euro extra in the budget, uh, 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 even uh, on top of what was already there. So we are working very hard from the Council now to have realistic budget to uh, see to it that also old buildings will be transferred and be accessible, even if all new buildings, uh, that is a must. Uh, the next step for us will continuous work to reach our goals as a city which is universally des designed in 2025. And it will also then, if it gets universally designed for the inhabitants, it will get universally designed for all the visitors and the tourists. That is my uh, point of view. If it's, if it's accessible for everyone, it's also accessible for tourists. Thank you very much. Fabulous. Excellent, Amrit. Um, I think there are several questions there, and uh, we, we have um, one of the questions there I've written down for a special prize. So get your questions down on paper, and we'll be back to you in just a couple of minutes. So just moving on. So we do have time for questions. Uh, our next speaker is Antonio Luis Martinez Pujalt. Pujalt. Uh, who is professor uh, from the Miguel Hernandez University in Spain, and he's specifically a new director uh, since 2015 of Research Units on Disability and Employment. And he will also be a distinguished represent our uh, receipt of uh, an award later this evening. So over to you, Antonio. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you very much to Zero Project for selecting this initiative as Innovative Practice 2018. I am going to talk about a very specific, uh, a very specific sample, a model of shops which are accessible for everyone, uh, also for persons with any disability. One of these shops is in my city, in Elche, near Alicante, in Spain, and it belongs to a wider project which is for and from project of Inditex Group. So let me introduce first 
the main actors of this project. In one hand, APSA is the most important association and service providers for persons with intellectual disabilities in the province of Alicante, Spain. With more than 300 professionals, it provides services to around 2,000 persons with intellectual disabilities and their families. And on the other hand, Tempe is the Inditex Group company, which designs, markets, and distributes the footwear and accessories of its retail brands, like Sara, Massimo Dutti, and others. It is the most important company of the city of Elche, with around 2,000 employees. And since 2007, APSA and Tempe work together in different projects to promote inclusion of persons with disabilities in the labor market, for our all persons with intellectual disabilities. They have set up volunteer programs. Uh, they have uh, um, organized programs of vocational training for persons with disabilities. They have promoted the creation of the research unit on disability and employment at my university, of which I am the director. And one of the joint initiatives has been also the creation of a store in, in the framework of this for and from project in Elche. For and From project is a project of Inditex Group uh, which uh, aim to develop a new concept of stores which are benchmark centers for social inclusion, accessibility and sustainability. We see in this diagram some of the main features that make up this new concept of store, like for example energy, energy efficiency, sustainable materials, universal design and accessibility and others. For and From project was uh, uh, born above all with two main goals. The first one, to promote employment for persons with disabilities, and the second one, to create shops which are accessible for all customers. Before the establishment of our shop in Elche, there were already four stores For and From in different cities of Spain, and Tempe Shop in Elche was number five, starting in 2010. Uh, our shop sells footwear and accessories of the eight retail brands of Inditex Group. To achieve the first one of the goals I just mentioned, employment, these shops are normally franchises run by non-profit organizations, APSA in the case of Elche, and staffed mainly by persons with disabilities. Following an initial donation from Inditex to fund the store's construction, the model then becomes self-sustaining based on the sale of the products, which are prior season products at a lower price. In our shop, we have a total of nine employees, five of them with physical or sensorial disabilities, and four with intellectual disabilities. And these employees, above all the employees with intellectual disabilities, have the support of a job trainer from APSA that helps them to face the different challenges of everyday work. But of course, in this presentation, I, I am going to focus on the second goal, which is the subject of this conference, 2018, uh, accessibility. The shop has an architectonic development, adaptation of furniture, and various technical solutions, which as well as facilitating the duties of the employees, I think this is an important point and I will come back to it, convert the establishment into a commercial reference, reference point in terms of accessibility and removal of barriers for persons with any disability. And in fact, our shop has received the Certificate of Universal Accessibility according to Standard uh, 1701. Uh, I will refer briefly to the different technical solutions that we have implemented, some of which are mentioned in the slide. First, access to the shop is through automatic sliding doors. In order to make the glass doors clearly visible, uh, two contrasting color horizontal strips have been placed across their width. They have access ramps also over the difference in floor level from the street. There is a painted guiding path of a different texture and color to those of the rate of, of the rest of the pavement that we see that in, that in the picture, which connects the commercial area with emergency exits and with the access to the cash desk, so that movement also by visually impaired people is facilitated. The corridors through the sales areas and the turning spaces are sufficiently uh, wide for people in wheelchairs. And a very important point, the signaling of the story is in easy reading. So that, that is one of the uh, principles of universal design that Gerald pointed out. The information must be simple and intuitive. For example, uh, we have different colors for each size and different symbols for men and women. So a square 
and cool colors for men, like the one I'm showing, uh, and circles and warm colors for women products, and then also triangles for children's sizes. And the color is different for each size. Uh, and the colors and symbols of the signals correspond also to those of the labels in every article, so the, 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 the shop is very easy to understand and is very uh, clearly organized, so to say. Uh, I will. Uh, I must also point out that signals and labels are also translated into Braille. A section of the cash desk has been uh, created at a lower height, adapted for people in wheelchairs or with achondroplasia. Of course, the bathroom is adapted and with uh, the doors are sliding, the flooring is anti-slip, all the accessories in the bathroom are placed at the recommendable height for wheelchair users, and the bathroom has also a care call system. The shop furnishings are fitted to the wall to avoid risks in the event of collision and to avoid difficulties in accessing products by reduced mobility uh, persons, by persons in wheelchairs, all products which are available on the top shelves are also available on the bottom shelves. And a very important point, the warehouse is also accessible to facilitate the work of employees with wide corridors and tuning spaces and the sizing identifier corresponding colors and symbols to those in the sales area. This is a very important point. When you make a shop accessible, you are not only protecting the right of access of potential customers with disabilities, you are also adapting the workplace for persons with disabilities and making possible that persons with disabilities work in that shop. So the two goals I mentioned, employment and disability, are indeed uh, strongly related to each other. Uh, to improve continuously the project, uh, Tempe has set up a quality control circle integrated by persons with different disabilities who visit the shop as anonymous customers and evaluate it its accessibility and report to the company. And in this moment, there are two, uh, 12 for and from shops in Spain. I say that ours was number five, so that means that since 2010, seven more have been created, one per year, and we are sure that this number will continue to grow and we hope we can export this model also out of Spain. And of course, I think this is a model that can be replicated by, the, by other commercial brands, as in the last years there has been a constant growth of persons with disability as customers, uh, uh, at least in Spain. To finish this presentation, I have the red light, but I would like to ask for two more minutes to tell the story of Marta. Marta is a girl with Down syndrome, and 27 years old, who works as shop assistant at front from Tempe Shop in Elche since its inauguration in 2010. She always wished to walk in contact with the public and in something related with the world of fashion. And after the proper training, she was able to be hired by Tempe in 2010. And when we interviewed her, when I interviewed her for this presentation, she told me two important things. The first one is that uh, she said that the accessibility of the shop helps persons with any disability to make any purchase by themselves alone. But the second uh, thing she added is that the accessibility of the shop also helps persons with disabilities like herself to walk with complete autonomy and independence. Uh, she also told us that she's happy to be working in for and from Tempe shop because she said work helps you to mature and to learn to take your own decisions and it makes you improve your self-esteem. So, right to accessibility and right to work, they are uh, very strongly related to each other. Both are proclaimed by the, international, by the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, but both are still far from being implemented. These are our challenges. Thank you very much for your attention. Excellent, Antonio. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, we will have questions after the next speaker, so I'm going to hand over straight to Roder Jensen, also from Norway. Uh, a senior advisor in public health and county governor of Telemark. Uh, his background in physical education and possibilities for physical activity for people in every day. So over to you, Roger. Thank you. <clears throat> I want to talk about a project with making accessible footpaths in Telemark. That means uh, trails which are wide, flat and have a solid surface. 
I will show you some pictures from some of the footpaths. Look at the ground, the people, and the surroundings. Our project is organized as a cooperation between these three regional authorities in Telemark, the county council, the county governor, and the road administration. The fourth partner is the Trekking Association, which is an NGO for walkers in the nature. We cooperate with all 18 municipalities, and this is an interdisciplinary project. You see the map of Norway, where Telemark is in the southern part, about two hours from our capital, Oslo. In 2012, we started with a survey in the municipalities in Telemark. The main question was, where can I go for a walk? We were thinking of persons with and without disabilities, and we asked about footpaths with universal design close to where people were living. <clears throat> the essence of the project is that we want to stimulate the inhabitants to be in physical activity. The public sector where we are working is important in health promotion. Walking is a good Norwegian tradition, but Norway and Telemark is hilly and uneven with many narrow valleys and places. The question is, how can we stimulate walking for all persons? The solution is many footpaths with universal design. Even when the infrastructure in villages and towns are planned and built, regional authorities and municipalities can cooperate and make results. It is possible to make a common transport system for walkers with and without disabilities. <clears throat> um, making footpaths is innovation. Technically, they are not difficult to build, but Accessibility, accessible footpaths is the missing link in densely populated areas. Then transport without going by car is a challenge, and good outdoor recreation is difficult to achieve. In our project, the impact is local development. All 18 municipalities in Telmark are working and creating accessible footpaths. 12 or 18 have so far built footpaths for all. Many disciplines participate in this work. Different landscape and ideas give different characteristics to the paths. From the different uh, disciplines, I can mention uh, public health, landscape planning, outdoor life, transport system, and universal design, of course. The path on the picture is also on the video in our stand in the trail down the stairs outside this room. The feedback we get from the municipalities tells that the footpaths make lots of advantages. The impact is measured as an increase of social meetings, outdoor life, nature experience, physical condition, and health for all in a climate-friendly way. They also inspired to think universal design in other arenas. Success factors are many. The aim is not controversial because of the good impacts on people. The footpaths are missing links in local infrastructure. Interdisciplinary work inspires to act and to cooperate. The costs are often small and financial possibilities exist. But to succeed, it is necessary to have endurance and work for years. <clears throat> you can read in the report of this conference about the user Annalisa Dahl, 79 years in Drangedal, Telmark. She needs a wheelchair when she's out. She says, those daily trips on my footpaths, on the footpaths, give meaning to my life. I get inspiration from nature, fresh air, and meeting other people. 
That means that the possibility to walk outdoor is important for her well-being. At last, the next steps in the project are to continue working as we have done so far and follow our vision that is, all citizens in Telemark can go for a walk close to their home. That means that they have worked for many years. The picture here shows that we are discussing to make footpaths on earlier railroads. We are lucky to have three long railroads where the train have stopped to go. Using them will give perfect accessibility for walkers and cyclists. You are welcome to join us and to go for a walk in Telemark. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roger. Um, so, sorry, some feedback there. So, people, questions for our first three presenters. Uh, who's first up to win the grand prize? First question from the audience. Let's see a hand up there. Otherwise, we will go down and we will accost you uh, if you do not participate. Yes, great. We have, we have the first winner. <laughs> what do I win? <laughs> That's a surprise at the end. Um, thank you very much. My name is Tracy Vaughan Goff. I'm from Sight Savers in the UK. My question is around the. Um, um, the, the From and For program, uh, which was very interesting, and it seems like uh, the organizations involved are making real progress. My question to you is how, um, within the mainstream stores, within the other stores that the organizations run, um, accessibility is being included? Thank you very much. Um, Thank you very much for your words. Uh, indeed, uh, this is, uh, I think we are, uh, in fact, making progress. Um, the first, uh, this was a pilot project. This is a very new project. I think we started in 2007. Our shop is from 2010 in Elche, but this is a, a, a very new project. So uh, the experience of this project is going to influence, of course, the rest of, of the shops of, in, the, in the tax group. No? Uh, in fact, for example, I must say that uh, one of our activities also of my research unit on disability and employment at the university is that we have a, a program, a training program for persons with intellectual disabilities at the university. And they do also practice in practices in some uh, in some shops as part of their training, and now one of them is uh, making uh, practices, for example, in a, in a Zara uh, main strip shop. And we are uh, confident that afterwards Zara will hire some of our uh, some of our students. So this is also a I mean, this project for and from depends from the Department of Social Corp... Um, of uh, uh, CR... How do you call it? Uh, of Corporate Social Responsibility. No? And from this department, we try to influence the whole uh, in the text group. And this is, this is our... And uh, this is our goal, no? but but it it depends from a from a specific department. It has it was born as a pilot project, and of course our goal is to influence the whole group. You know, Sarah has 3,000 shops in the whole world. If these 3,000 shops would hire people with disabilities, would be completely accessible. A real progress would be made. Thank you, Antonio. Okay, we're getting the hands up here, uh, just here in the front, um, if you say your name and question. Okay. Okay. Hello, my name is Martin from Austria. Um, I have a question to the last speaker. 
concerning uh, the accessible food, uh, food paths. So I really liked the project as I had a research project also in this field of, um, of making paths accessible, accessible for elderly, as this is also the most wanted uh, leisure time activity of elderly people is uh, hiking. And when researching European uh, projects in this field, it was very often that there were projects done, that there were accessible routes, uh, hiking paths, somehow collected in an area, and then after project end, they were gone and the data was not updated. And there was no uh, European database or something like that for really having a good overview where are accessible hiking paths. So do you have anything in plan to have uh, your uh, efforts really sustainable and also connected on a European level? Um, we have no plan for this, but we, we are working with this. We are, we are in the process, um, and we think that will be a, a subject in the process for many years. And, and I think uh, one risk to, to get this uh, success is to, that the paths are very close to the centres where all people are going. So there are many people using those paths, and that is uh, like a control from the from the public. Um, it is the municipalities who has uh, the control of the sustainability afterwards. But I think that will be a, a topic we can take further with us. Thank you. Very good question. And directly behind there, lady, uh, if you want to answer. Good morning, my name is Marta, and I come from Madrid, from Fundación Prodis. And I'm very happy to have listened to Antonio, because we, Prodis, in Madrid, have also a forum from SHOP. And we had a very close relation to La Universidad de Elche when we were starting over with the project. And I must say that it's a project that it works really, really well. We have actually employed 13 people, uh, three of them with intellectual disabilities. And in the very close future, we are very happy to say that we're going to have another shop in Madrid. So I am very, very happy to have listened to him because he, they have done a great work that has helped others like us to start over this great project by the Grupo Inditex, and especially Tempe and Forum From. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marta. It's a great joy that to hear you and to listen to you because, of course, Prodis Foundation is one of our uh, of our main partners now. Uh, I must say that with the, with the relation with Prodis Foundation in Madrid was was almost by a, by chance no? because we when we tried to start this research unit on disability and employment and this program to train persons with intellectual disabilities at the university. We contacted with Prodis Foundation, which had already this program in the University of Madrid. And then, in this moment, a new forum from shop was being, uh, was being going to, to be opened in Madrid. And we uh, told the project of Prodis Foundation, and they said, well, we take it. We uh, uh, get charge of this project. And, uh, I think the, the, the shop in Madrid is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a very good shop and it's a very good model also. also. And so uh, the next one will be 14th uh, for and from shop. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, last question. There is over on the left hand side, find a speaker. Glasses. Sorry. Uh, I'm Mr. Krippert, a project manager of uh, public transport in Vienna, and I was very interested about accessibility in shop and shop areas. Uh, and you, you said uh, the colors are wide enough for wheelchairs. 
but uh, if you're working, uh, disabled people working on a working place, they need as well restrooms and toilets. And what about the toilets? How are they equipped? Do you have emergency facilities? Uh, if something happened in a toilet, oh, how are they equipped? And what about the standard uh, concerning that in Spain? Restrooms in our shop are completely adapted. Uh, we have uh, the, the different, uh, the doors of the bathroom are, are sliding, the flooring is anti-slip, all the accessories are placed at the recommendable height for wheelchair users, and the bathroom has also a care call system. So uh, we have all the adaptations, and uh, in fact, the, the persons with uh, disabilities that are working in the shop uh, tell us that they can work with complete autonomy. And also, we test, as, as, as I said, we test the shop uh, continuously by persons with disabilities that visit the shop and, and report. So, of course, that, that's, also, uh, that's uh, also one of the uh, specific characteristics. So we, we uh, all the technical solutions in our shop try to be uh, both for customers and for employees, because uh, both uh, goals are important, that customers can uh, access to a shop without any problem, but also that the workers can uh, do their work with complete autonomy if they have any disability. I will also add one question one that I didn't say in my presentation. Normally in these shops there is always some of the employees that uh, can't speak uh, sign language. So that if a deaf person which is user of the sign language goes to a shop, she can also, he or she can also make himself understand and talk to one of the shop assistants. No? Thank very good. You. Thank you very much uh, for the questions and audience participation. So just moving on uh, to our next speaker, uh, Lee McMahon, uh, who is Environment and Health and Safe Manager with the Central Bank in Ireland. Uh, over 20 years experience in risk and change management and uh, looking forward to this presentation um, from another award winner here. Over to you, Lee. Thanks very much, Chair. And um, it, it, I know it's been said by a number of people here today and yesterday, but it is an absolute honour to be involved in such um, an event as this to bring so many good ideas and diverse thinking around the same problems um, to the same room and to have discussions helpful um, for everybody. Um, I'd also like to thank the Zero Project, uh, not just for the dozens of emails that have flooded my inbox, um, like everyone else's, uh, since we embarked on this journey, but uh, to pull something like this together is just phenomenal. So um, I congratulate you entirely. Um, looking at my presentation there now, I, I'm also going to give the timekeeper something back here because I'm actually going to rattle through my presentation. But before I do that, um, I, I'm just looking at the title and I realise that when we wrote the, the presentation and when we wrote the submission, it was very much around trying to tell a story in a forum that we weren't sure about. It also looks like we tried to win a prize for the longest title. Um, I'm not even going to attempt to read it now. Um, but having been here yesterday and, and hearing what I've heard and again this morning, I, I, I'm going to give you the three key takeaways now before I go through the story. Um, because one of them actually isn't even in it, but it occurred to me yesterday as I was listening to other presentations, what is important. Um, um, what, I would, what I'd say is that, A, um, well, to give some context, it was about the development of our new headquarters building in Dublin. And we were moving from five separate buildings into one single building, actually, which is, we've now developed a second. But um, to give you a, a, the three key takeaways in terms of our success in, in our journey was one, having accessibility identified early um, as a separate work stream. So I as access officer for the bank, as well as being the environmental manager and the safety manager, um, I was driving that mandate. And it, it wasn't a mandate that a lot of people in the bank were familiar with. Um, so it, it was all about influencing and making people more aware of why we needed to do things differently. Um, so getting it recognised wasn't a foregone conclusion and I had to make several approaches before we got it identified. Um, 
and it was based around our outcomes and saying that we wanted the best outcomes, so that helped. Uh, in terms of the second element, I'd say is that it's engaging technical experts. So my colleague is here with me today, who is an independent accessibility consultant, Owen O'Hurley. Um, I certainly didn't come to a, the accessibility or the role as access officer with any technical background in the field. Um, yes, it, it dovetailed with a lot of what I did from a safety perspective um, and creating a safe environment, but it, it, there was no technical expertise there in terms of the different guidelines and, and whatever else was involved. And I'd say the third element would be that the fact that we engaged with the, our staff members who were disabled um, throughout the process, very much looking to them to identify to us what their challenges were today so that we, it would help us understand them with a view to designing them out for tomorrow. Um, and and the good news is that there's a two minute video at the end of this um, which will actually articulate what we did and how, and how we achieved it far better than I ever could. So. Um, Without further ado, I'll, I'll kick into the presentation itself. Just to explain to you what the bank is, the national central, it's a national central bank, so we're the equivalent of um, the Bundesbank in Germany or the Bank of England and the Financial Services Authority in England and the UK. So we have a regulatory capacity um, as well as a financial stability um, requirement that we work to maintain. Um, we have, our challenges were the same as a lot of organizations um, we were in old buildings, um, we needed to improve things, we could see there was room for enhancement across the board, not just in our buildings but in the services and how we provide them and the information. There was plenty of opportunities that we could pursue, with the first one being that I was uh, appointed as an access officer nearly eight years ago and when I started with the bank. Um, the fusion program which was our, our building program for the new headquarters, so that presented an opportunity to actually start from scratch. Uh, although we inherited a shell and core of a building um, that gave us some limitations in that regard. Senior management were already committed to making changes in how we worked, um, so they were looking at technologies as well as the physical environment, and so that provided us with other opportunities. Um, bank staff, the people who were already in the bank or were indirectly or directly impacted by uh, disability, all viewed that there could be improvements made. And from an ethical perspective, the corporate social and responsibility perspective, it made sense to try and make the building, it being a public building, um, as accessible and inclusive as, a, as possible. From an innovation perspective, we looked at uh, the different elements being we needed to come up with a strategy, policy behind that. We need to look at the physical elements, the design and build, um, and then we need to look at how we were going to run the building and facilities within it after we moved in. But I suppose the big question is, how do you go about that? So the different elements that we employed were we engaged the independent technical expert, he worked alongside our design team but independent of it, so it helped us help them raise the bar in terms of what they were designing for us. Um, we incorporated universal design at every stage of the, of the program from the earliest stages. Um, we trained the project managers um, who were representing all the different work streams in understanding universal design and, and the importance of it and what it meant um, so that they could actually inform, we could help them inform decisions that we wouldn't even get sight of. Um, and then we involved staff members, as I mentioned, and we had ongoing reviews. Um, it also allowed us to embed the procurement element between the equipment and the workstations, the uh, technology, everything involved, we got to inform the specifications for that. We created greater awareness through uh, making videos so that staff were aware of what we were trying to do and encourage feedback from them. And it was, it was accepted as part of our mandate, um, in, included within our induction and manuals and uh, information provided from a diversity perspective. Visually, these are just some pictures of our multi-purpose center uh, and one of the internal stairwells. So just to give you an idea, but you'll see that in the video. But the improvements were, some of them that I list here are ex greater accessibility to the parking, the reception desks were more accessible, waiting collaboration areas were much more diverse for all shapes and sizes, and um, we had much bigger lifts and a very smart system which is programmable around individual, their swipe card, so someone may need the door hold, held open longer, someone may need an audio or a visual alert. So um, by doing these things we helped improve awareness across everything we were doing, so much so that just after we moved into the bank, staff themselves started a bankability, which is a, a, um, a staff-driven network uh, based around people who were directly or indirectly impacted by disability. 
so it was great, and you can see a, a picture there. There's a smile fest in the, in terms of Jer, um, my compatriot there, was presenting us at the National Award for Universal Design, um, which we won last year, and we're very proud to. But most importantly, there's the feedback from the building user. Um, and my, one of my colleagues there, who's pictured at the lift, Tony, came across and said, when I asked him for a testimonial, you can see what he said there. And that's why it reminded me why we, we are as determined as we are to make these changes. Where do we go next? We, we push on through our policy and our strategy. We're continuously training staff. Um, and we're trying to engage with project teams throughout the bank as early as possible. So that things like website redesign, et cetera, that we're hitting them early and not causing a problem. I leave it there. And what I'll ask of now of our audiovisual colleagues at the back can actually play the video um, for us. And I'll say thank you very much. By recognising the importance of good accessibility early in the North Key design process, the bank put itself in the driving seat for building on the basic requirements of building regulations. By introducing an independent accessibility consultant into the design process, provided the technical expertise to identify opportunities to improve on compliance and make our building and facilities as inclusive as possible for everyone. Delivering North Key required input from multiple work streams, all with their own priorities. To help turn this challenge into an opportunity, we ran workshops with the accessibility consultant so that each area understood the importance and principles of good accessibility. This helped to inform hundreds of decisions across the entire design process that ultimately helped produce the work environment which is recognised by the National RIAI Universal Design Award received earlier this year. What the award also reinforces is the belief that an accessible environment can be beautiful as well as practical. Examples of this are the internal staircases that are based on the International Building for Everyone standard and not just building regulations. It just goes to show that contrasting tones and textures do not have to leap out of you to work. Using a different floor finish can help define a walkway and encourage safe access for everyone. If you take the floor signage and the wayfinding, it's contrasting but it fits in. Staircases that look great and work very well a variety of workspaces and different furniture to meet all kinds of needs, equipment that facilitates different shapes, sizes and work styles, technology that supports and meets specific requirements, and facilities and services that are just more accessible. The Northwall Key Fusion Programme is also involved in engagement with staff who were best placed to help identify challenges faced in existing buildings. Working with this group allowed the bank to raise the bar even further in terms of inclusivity before we had even set foot in the building. At the end of the day, universal design principles applied well should improve everyone's experience in a building like North Wall Key. Thank you very much, Liam. Well done. And our next speaker is Michael Perry, uh, who is the Executive Vice President of Progressive AE, an architectural firm in the USA. And I will hand over straight to you, Michael, to give your presentation. Sorry, getting feedback. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, in yesterday's opening ceremony, Daniela Boss talked about the importance of making impact and uh, so today I'm going to tell a brief story about the Mary Freebed YMCA, which is located in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And it's really creating its own community impact. And just for scale, it's a 36-acre development with a 118,000-square-foot building. And it's also a story I think is scalable and repeatable at the same time. So this is just a, a quickly look at the stakeholders we got together very early on. It involved, of course, the Y, Mary Freebed Hospital, the Global Universal Design Commission, disability advocates, and together uh, this team created the vision uh, and the design principles. When we do a project, we always identify design principles, and those are really kind of the key priorities for the project. Um, and it was really about being inclusive, um, driving innovative programming, uh, and really uh, trying to create a model for YMCAs across the country. And then the design measures are really how we're going to go back and measure success. You heard about that a little bit already today. 
Um, but this is really, um, and, you'll, and I'll, I'll mention at the end of the presentation, but we go back and a one year post occupancy, we will actually go back and, um, and validate. So this is the entrance. Um, and again, uh, starting from the very beginning, uh, no curbs, no steps, no thresholds. The parking is closer to the entry um, and automatic doors and the entry is very simple and uh, intuitive. And so the concepts are great when we talk about universal design and inclusivity, but um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the physical strategies that we actually implemented into the building. So after one enters the building, you immediately come in and uh, you see this ramp. Uh, this is a two-story uh, building that has no stairs um, and no steps in it and no thresholds between any of the floor finishes. We are very careful with the concrete slab pour to make sure that um, all of the um, flooring surfaces could be seamless. Uh, we used, um, we also studied the science of color as we started this project, and you'll see three basic colors that were used. Yellow, which exemplifies uh, an uplifting of spirits. Blue, which um, are areas of concentration. And greens, uh, which represent balance. Now this ramp, um, as you go down the ramp, uh, when you have a change of slope, there's a change of color. Again, to denote, it's eight feet wide. And we designed it specifically so three people could pass independently. And we also used a lot of natural lighting. Uh, so at the very center of the ramp, we infuse it with natural lighting. Um, the yellow is quite stark. Um, and as many of you know, uh, seniors um, many times get disoriented in large buildings. And so just about anywhere in the building, they can look back and see this yellow and know where they came into the project. So uh, this project was also specifically de designed for wheelchair athletes. One of the stakeholders was the Mary Freebed Adaptive Sports Program, a very competitive group. Um, and then on the, on the upper right is the track. It's a fifth of a mile track um, with high contrasting colors so that people can stay in their lanes and a continuous handrail and it's used all the time by a variety of people. Uh, in the lower right hand, uh, this is Pat. Um, it's very important um, in a fitness facility to infuse accessible equipment and not have it set off someplace by itself. So this is the same machine that I, will, I would use, the Cybex machine, Pat and I would just take turns on it. The other thing we've included in this building, which was very important from early input, is that wheelchair athletes come here, uh, their, their sports chair is different from their everyday chair, and so we've included a wheelchair a storage room and a repair shop in this building. So on the left hand side is the aquatics environment. There are actually three bodies of water in this building. Um, and um, I use the same pool, that's my form of exercise, I swim. Um, what you see here in the foreground, that tiled two step um, is called the transfer station. And um, we've included that in all the pools. And the idea there is somebody in a wheelchair or a walker or who needs help can come to it, transfer onto it, transfer themselves into the pool independently, not ask for help, swim, do what they need to do, and then get back into, up, up to the transfer station. We also used um, the end of the lane lines in the pool are actually a bright orange. Uh, most accidents in pools happen at the, at the uh, end of the pool. So it's another visual cue to alert individuals that the end of the pool is coming up. Um, <clears throat> and we did the same thing with the, uh, the uh, markers above the flag markers. Um, the upper right is, is the climbing wall. Uh, we did a lot of benchmarking. We went down to a place uh, called um, Virginia G. Piper Sports Institute in Phoenix. And uh, they had a climbing wall. And the thing we learned was that um, uh, individuals who are blind love to climb walls. They get a great sense of accomplishment. And so uh, that's one of the things we have here is an adaptive blind um, climbing sports program. Um, the picture in the lower right, uh, this is, we have 16 family locker rooms. 
The blue table there is called a mat table. And um, the idea there is that, again, somebody in a wheelchair or a walker or who can come in and independently transfer onto it, get themselves changed for their sporting activity, and then leave. Uh, the one thing we did learn post-occupancy was that we should have done more of these. We only did two, and the demand for them is really, really high. So we've included on the left-hand side wider corridors. There you can see some of the blue. Uh, those are the meeting rooms, again, the areas of concentration. Um, automatic doors are used extensively throughout the building. Um, in the upper right-hand corner is a teaching kitchen. Uh, we have uh, two counters, uh, elevations there uh, so for people to use, but we also included a mirror above it on a specific angle so that um, people who have challenges with um, uh, rotating their head and neck can actually see the event occurring at the same time also. Um, as I mentioned, this is a 36-acre site. We have softball fields, tennis courts, soccer, there's a barn, there's a greenhouse. But in the lower right is an asphalt um, softball field, and this was specifically uh, driven by the wheelchair athletes. Um, one thing that I learned is, you know, when we started this project, we thought, well, it should be a soft surface. But no, they want a hard surface because of they want to compete at a very, very high level. So even in the dugouts, we've included extra power outlets because many of them come and use powered wheelchairs, and they want to be at peak performance. So when they come out of the game, they plug in to power up and then go back into the game. So we actually teamed up with the John F. Butzer Center for Research, um, and we conducted a scientific research study on this. This is actually a standardized research project, very specific questions we had to adhere to. And the hypothesis was uh, involvement in a universally designed built environment will promote positive changes in the attitudes of key stakeholders toward persons with disabilities. And so before the, but as the design started, we, we tested a group of individuals. A year later, we retested, and there was a 95% certainty that the change is statistically significant. And this was actually presented um, a few months ago in Chicago at a National Rehab um, Institute conference. So this is the, uh, these are the success factors, the validation components. Um, these were the same ones we saw up front called the design measures. And you can see that one of the goals was to be certified by the GUDC, which it was. And actually, the, it was the first adopter of the GUDC standards. Um, the increase in membership, you can see. The, the increase in gate visits. We've doubled the senior members. Revenue has increased 25%. There's been 19 new programs and eight new adaptive sports programs created. Why? Because there's a universally designed um, physical building that allows them to do this. And the utility costs went down 14%. So this is really about the return on investment. Um, and you know, it really starts with um, the right group of stakeholders and a knowledgeable architect getting together and really kind of creating a vision. And you know, this team really drove innovation uh, for removing barriers in the built environment. Uh, the thing I'm probably most proud of, uh, you know, beyond the measures, is the fact that um, there is a whole group of the community in, in West Michigan uh, that are now going to a YMCA. Um, <clears throat> they're working out, they're getting fit, they're building a broader social network, and they're improving their quality of life. So the why really is um, ending up, it's, it's really about an environment for everybody um, with all abilities. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a great um, journey for me uh, personally. Um, I belong to a why for as long as I can remember, and um, it's my home also, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. And again, an important point about universal design is to see the cost. So I think that's great to see something like that, Michael. Thank you. 
Moving on, uh, second last. Also, I've been informed the Petra over here on my left, your right, is doing an artistic impression of what has happened here this morning. So we will hear from Petra just at the end, so please wait for that. So without further ado, over to Leah, uh, who is from Hamburg, Germany, and works for the foundation there. So over to you, Leah. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk less about architecture and more about how to participate people in the process of an, uh, an urban development project. And um, this is called an, A Neighborhood for Everyone. I myself work for the project Q8 at the Stiftung Alsterdorf Foundation. And um, the Stiftung Alsterdorf provides several services for people with disabilities, children and young people. Um, things like education, assistance for people with disabilities, and health care. Um, Q8 is a neighborhood development project in Hamburg. As you can see on the little map, there are different neighborhoods, and mine is um, in Altona, which is close to the river. Um, the goal of that project is to develop new support and care structures and to strengthen the inclusiveness of a local community. And thereby, we want to increase the participation of the neighborhood citizens. And together with local other stakeholders, Q8 is looking for solutions for the different challenges in the fields of social life, healthcare, and also the work with people with disabilities. I, as a project manager at Q8, um, work as an intermediary. And that means that I create networks between uh, local stakeholders and citizens, but also politicians and the administration at the neighborhood or district. And um, I also have an eye on the market process. Um, yeah. Our goal is to create a mix of self-help, neighborhood civic engagement, support of technology, and also personal, uh, professional support. And all together, we want to make the neighborhood's potential visible and create win-win situations for everyone involved in the neighborhood. And before I can tell you more about um, a neighborhood for everyone, that initiative, I have to tell you something about the first, uh, the new urban development project, which is called Mitte Altona. In English, you would say Midtown Altona. And this is one of the biggest urban development projects in Hamburg. Um, at the end, there will be living 10, around 10,000 people. And at the moment, um, it's still, yeah, half of the um, property is still railways, and also before there were, um, it was a railway yard. And um, this is the whole master plan on, on the picture there on the right. And um, on the right of that picture, there's the first construction phase with 1,600 apartments, and the first citizens just moved in in November. Um, when my colleague heard about the new urban development project in 2012, she initiated the process, A Neighborhood for Everyone. And, and on the picture, you can see the kickoff event with around 220 people. Um, and since then, there were different forums and meetings um, yeah, about the topic of urban development and inclusive, inclusion. And the attendees, uh, the attendees' backgrounds and motives are pretty various. They are neighbors, they are future residents, investors, developers, socio and socio-politically interested people, academics who worked with uh, several universities, um, people from administration and also parliamentary delegates. And the aim was or is to create an inclusive quarter related to the topics of accessibility, housing, working in local economy and uh, social life. 
And what is so special about a neighborhood for everyone is that um, within a really short time, a lot of people came together and created a quite high level of expertise about the topic of social inclusion and urban development. And uh, through workshops, the people developed a paper with 30 goals and steps of inclusive urban development. And those goals and steps go back and forth across all works of life, not only barrier-free public spaces, but also communication and involvement of residents and uh, integration of residential concepts. The goals and steps have been the foundation of recommendations for several important steps for that urban development process, like um, the urban development master plan and also the contract between the landowners and the city of Hamburg. Um, the forum achieved quite quick uh, reputation. Just half a year um, after the kickoff event, the district parliament of Hamburg Altona decided that the goals and steps should find their way into the process of Mitte Altona and all further uh, urban development planning. And also, the Hamburg government uh, decided to use a neighborhood for everyone as an example and on their agenda. And uh, what is really great to see is that politicians just have begun to have social inclusions in their thoughts and um, yeah, use it more regularly and more in a normal way. And uh, we're also very happy that uh, it got international recognition in 2015. It was awarded as innovative practice in, here at Zero Project. And in 2016, it was chosen as the best as a best practice by the UNDESA in the field of accessible urban development. So what does it look like? Um, here are some examples of what it will look like really soon. Um, in Midtown Altona, there were building societies which could uh, apply and now start to live in the in the neighborhood and they only could apply with an inclusive concept and on the far uh, on the upper left picture you can see um, a building society with Turkish and German people who want to grow old together um, in the neighborhood there will also be inclusive shops and restaurants where people with disabilities uh, work and um, on the picture on the bottom right you can see people trying out a newly developed curbstone and a sidewalk um, for Mitte Altona. And now all public spaces can be accessible in the neighborhood and also 94% of the apartments can be reached barrier free. Just a quick... Um, yeah, mention about the financing. The Neighborhood for Everyone is financially supported by the Project Q8. Um, um, costs like room rental or expert fees and printing costs and things like that are covered that way. And Q8 itself is an initiative of the Stiftung Alsterdorf Foundation, what, which I mentioned before, and is financed by the Senate and State Government and the Nordmetall Stiftung Foundation, the program Aktion Mensch, and the Foundation Alsterdorf itself. Um, yeah, now the, plan, the process of planning is finished and the first people have been moving in and the neighborhood is slowly becoming real, which is really exciting for us. Um, it's not perfectly inclusive, but you can find a lot of uh, inclusive elements there. And, what is so un um, and that's why it's so interesting to still monitor the implementations and maybe even bring in new ideas to make inclusiveness even more visible in the neighborhood. Um, we also want to bring the knowledge and expertise into new urban development projects. By a coincidence, in the neighborhood, there's a big new urban development project where a brewery was before, and we want to bring in that knowledge we gained um, into that project already. 
And I just want to say one more sentence, um, because what is really great to see is that participation in the right framework can successfully generate socio-political ideas and implementation. And that's what still, after six years, keeps the people continuing and motivates them going, and also what makes the world for me really exciting and fun. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Leah. Uh, again, showing great innovation, uh, looking at the whole area of the neighbourhood. So, our last distinguished speaker uh, is Ian McKinnon, uh, all the way from Scotland, working in London. Uh, very important to mention Scotland. Co-founder and director of inclusive design for the Global Disability Innovation Hub, uh, based in London, and also the. Uh, Inclusive Design Lead for London Legacy Development Corporation. So over to you, Ian. Thank you very much indeed. Um, pleasure to be here and to talk to you. I shall uh, try and keep to time as the, the last speaker on the panel. Um, but yeah, I am from the, the Global Disability Innovation Hub. But as the session is, is looking at universal design in the built environment, I will be focusing on my work as the client uh, the client lead on inclusive design for Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, which was the home of the Olympic and the Paralympic Games back in 2012. Um, I don't know if any of you went or were able to go or even, even participate, I don't know, but um, it was a fantastic event. Um, so I'm going to take you through. Um, before I start, actually, I should also just caveat slightly that, that when I'm conscious when I give this presentation, um, the, the, the feedback is often that, well, you guys had a, a huge budget and significant public funding a, a, and support to do this project, and that is true. However, hopefully the, uh, the processes and procedures that I'll, I'll talk through in the next eight minutes or so, I, I believe are very transferable regardless of the scale of project you, you're working on and the resource that you have, and hopefully that comes across. This is just my, my personal um, uh, what I personally believe inclusive design is, my, my definition, if you like. I'm not saying this is right. Uh, it will almost certainly change over time. But I believe that inclusive design and universal design, same thing to me, can help all human beings experience the world around them in a fair and equal way. And I'd just like to start with that. But let me take you back six years to the 2012 Games. Uh, it was the most successful and the most accessible uh, Olympic and Paralympic Games ever, and I don't think that's a coincidence. It was the first ever sold out Paralympic Games, which was quite a milestone. Um, in the UK in particular, we really believe we saw a shift, a positive shift in perception around disability, uh, disabled people and obviously disability sport as a result of the success of the Games. It had more TV coverage than ever before, a lot of that down to the fantastic work certainly in the UK by Channel 4, um, and they're continuing to see the positive benefits of that today. Uh, it had the most diverse games workforce ever, uh, and it had a discernible impact on the private sector that, that supplied the games. So it was more than just a sporting event, uh, and I hope that's, that's coming across. In terms of the, the development work that we do in the park now, and have been doing for the past six years or so, <clears throat> embedding in inclusive design starts at the very beginning. It really starts at the idea of having a project at all, and that's where you embed it. And that's really my first key point. I have some key points that I'll pick up as I go through. Uh, and that's the first one. So for me and for us, that really begins at procurement. As soon as you go out to the market and have conversations about a project, at that point, you have to be very clear just how high a priority inclusive design is for you as a client. Um, and that way, all the tender discussions, conversations, submissions, and bids that you get have to demonstrate and show their track record and how they will um, deliver and embed inclusive design in that project. And eventually that then gets translated into the contract agreement that you have with them, so it's set in stone. Uh, and that, that's incredibly important. Um, in terms of our process, uh, we, London Legacy Development Corporation, who's responsible for the park, we, we're also the planning authority, so quite lucky in that regard. So, so we have a local plan, a planning policy. And enshrined in that is a requirement to meet our inclusive design standards. We have policy, we have inclusive uh, design strategy and a, a quality and inclusion policy, which are kind of fairly high level 
documents that set out our ambitions and, and, and intentions uh, regarding accessibility and inclusion. The, the, the standards, though, are technical standards, but we didn't go away and kind of write our own or kind of rewrite the rule book. What we did was to cherry pick the very best of existing good practice that, that was out there in the world uh, and in the UK for us, and distill that in one document uh, as a benchmarking tool, which we could then hand over to developers, partners we were working with, and say, this is what we expect from you as an absolute minimum. And that became a very powerful tool for us to physically hand them this document. Um, there's my role, not, not me per se, but that my role exists uh, as the inclusive design champion at the organisation. Uh, I'm involved from procurement, as I said, right the way through to, to the operation of the building, which uh, I'm very, uh, it's a benefit to be able to do that. Um, and it's, it's, it's great that we have that. And then as important as the involvement of disabled people, and that's key point too, really, for me is to involve, genuinely consult with and include disabled people and local people to wherever you're building uh, in the process. And we do that through our built environment access panel. Um, it's an independent panel with its own chair, but my, part of my job is to make sure all the development work that we do in the park goes through that panel for independent review, and they, they genuinely shape what is eventually delivered on the park. Um, I've got, I'm going to finish with some case studies. So this is Timber Lodge. Uh, it's one of my favourites. It was what, the first building that we finished on the park post-games. It's quite a modest building, but it packs a lot of punch, I, I believe, for the size of it. It's, it also won the 2014 Civic Trust Award and the Selwyn Goldsmith Award for Universal Design in the UK, which was a, a, a kind of high accolade, so I'm, I'm proud of it. But it's, it's just, it just works well. You know, it's, it's kind of true inclusive design. It's not obvious. It just works for everyone. Good circulation, natural lighting, acoustics, great toilet facilities, both accessible loos. It has a change in places facility, which is a large adult change toilet facility for people with more severe disabilities that may need support by, by one or two personal assistants. It's got a multi-faith room, very important as it responds to the local demographic of the park. It's an incredibly diverse part of East London where we're located and it responds to that. Flexible community use and it's run by a social enterprise that em employs a large number of disabled people. And that's key point uh, three for me, which is the management and operation of your facility is as important, if not in some cases more important than the physical structure that you have. The, uh, the disability equality and awareness training of your staff, particularly the front of the house of staff, is so important, um, and that, as important as the physical uh, building itself. Case study two is uh, we're building a huge amount of new homes and residential in the park, and we really challenged our first neighbourhood development partner to go away and, and come up with something new, to innovate, to do something that hadn't been done before. And they took us up on that challenge. And what they came back with was a new typology, a new housing typology, which they called the multi-generation home. Now, this responds to both the, multi, the, the demographic, the, the multicultural demographic around the park, where you have a lot of intergenerational living, many generations living in the same house. And essentially, they took uh, all corner plots. Uh, they had a townhouse with an annex, all built to wheelchair accessible uh, and adaptable standards. But for us, what, that, what we felt that meant was you could also have, if you had a disabled adult in the family, who wanted to live independently but close to the family home, it would facilitate that. So for us, we thought that was a, a great idea. And is now a USP for that architect firm. They are using this typology and selling it on other developments off the park. The third uh, final case study is, is and that's my key point number four really, is don't never feel bound by regulations and by guidance. They are there as a, a guide simply. Um, don't feel that that is the absolute way that, that something must be done. Don't be bold, go beyond what is written in legislation and guidance. A um, couple of very small examples here, products that we have in the park. One is a, a tactile and audio map. Um, we developed with blind and partially sighted users. It offers tactile information and audio information when you touch it. But it's used by everyone on the park, and that's, again, good inclusive design. Everyone uses it and benefits from it. The second, uh, interestingly similar with regards to Michael's comments about access and out of the pool, the key point being independent access, and this pool pod product offers that without requiring assistance from, uh, from staff, which is so important. So to sum up, really, I think as a, as a client, Certainly, you need to be committed and proactive, and I know that's not always the case, but certainly in our, in our case, we do. 
uh, integrate the requirements right at the very start of the project, in our case from procurement, have an inclusive design champion throughout the project, involve disabled people, co-create with disabled people and local people, uh, push for innovation and then reap the rewards, celebrate it when it works. I think often we don't do that enough, really celebrate and showcase uh, when it works well. And just to finish, I think, what I'd really like to get to is a, is a position, and I think we will, where people like me, so-called specialists in this area and access consultants and the like, cease to exist, actually. There's no, there's no need for us because design experts, it will all, inclusive design will eventually be universally understood, um, appreciated, and in the mainstream. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. As we wait for Petra to bring across her... Um, a great artistic impression of this morning. Uh, one, I would like a round of applause for, I think, seven fantabulous uh, presentations here this morning. So again, covering the, the city, the, the Olympics, uh, to banking, um, to Oslo, looking at, again, strategies, process. I think a key point from this morning is this is a long game. This is not something you start today and it finishes next Sunday. It is long game as we heard from Ian, the last speaker there, the Olympics. Right, that was 10 years in planning, uh, the Olympics moving to London. What we heard from Anne Merritt here beside me about Oslo, the strategies from Oslo on getting universal design and looking to 2025. Antonio, shopping, uh, Liam and um, uh, the, our speakers, sorry, getting the name, Roger, uh, Michael, talking about key areas of life from shopping, banking, leisure, very important. Uh, Lee again looking at the whole neighbourhood aspect. So, over to you, Petra. Yeah, it's working. Okay, a short summary of uh, seven presentations is quite a challenge, but let's give it a try. Uh, we heard from, I'm not going at in the right direction, but let's start with Oslo. Um, the project of universally designed Oslo by 2025, where we heard that it's based on legislation and the UN Convention, but also um, the main part was really to involve people with disabilities and involve um, the people of Oslo to be part of the whole project. That is just one of the things we heard of that great project. Um, so it's a holistic approach, having a realistic budget and making sure that the decision really is uh, made within the municipality so that they can also give direction. Uh, we heard of a shoe store for all, that's how I would translate it, um, where people with all kinds of disabilities are not only to be customers, but also to be employees, or are actually employees within the store. So the goal always was to address all these issues. And in the questions asked later on, even within the bathrooms and the aisles and all the sh uh, shoes are exhibited in different heights. So everybody, depending on what height they're coming in, can look at the same sortiment of shoes, just to see some examples. Um, this brings me to the Central Bank of Ireland, where we heard that they had to move from, was it five um, buildings into one new headquarter. And we heard that often, but very, very precisely here, that once you start a project like this, you start in the first step with thinking about universal design and design for all. Um, what they did is they involved um, employees with disabilities as a source, but also a technical um, expert to give them information on how to really go through the whole process and then end up with a building that is really accessible for everyone and measures up to the design for all principles. Next. Sports, important for all our health, and people with disabilities, of course, also must want to do sports. How can we do it if we find attractive places like the Mary Free Bed YMCA? A lot of examples. I was very fascinated by the um, 
but by the fact that blind people like to climb and that you need more climbing walls because you only made two. So build climbing walls and uh, offer service for everyone, in this case, especially for blind people. But there was a lot of information we heard. Example, natural lighting instead of artificial light or contrast colors to make sure that people with all kinds of disabilities or without disabilities can come and be part of it. Just one thing, numbers, we have a decrease in utility cost, just as an example. Yeah? Things have to be measured. Talking about impact. Hamburg. Um, we heard about an inclusive local community. Um, uh, Midtown Altlona in Hamburg is becoming a neighborhood for everyone. And it is very much of a bottom-up process where the local population with and without disabilities was involved. And then um, support structures have been developed, housing, accessibility all, to all shops, restaurants, to work, everything within this area um, must be accessible for everyone and participation of the local community is key from what I heard at the end. Telemark. We heard that the Norwegians love walking. Now, for those of you who are from Austria, like me, we also love walking. So that is um, obviously one of the possibilities to bring people into physical activity. Now, what was done in Telemark was that walking paths are becoming accessible for wheelchair users, but not only. So creating accessible footpaths um, as one of the activities to bring people outdoor, bring them together and have a nice and good life. The last presentation we heard was about uh, Global Disability Innovation Hub, about the Paralympics. And uh, there, I think the four keys that I picked up at the end was, again, if you have this idea of universal design, you must implement it right in the beginning. Um, then you have to have policies and standards in place to tell everyone about it, and then involve people with disabilities and local people again so that the project can be a success. Another key to success is also how you manage your project. Manage it well and make sure that design for all is implemented all the time. And go beyond legislation. Do more than the law requires. And then you can celebrate in the end. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you very much, Petra. Uh, great summary of this morning. Again, just to thank the speakers. Sorry we have no time for questions. You need to grab a coffee to go to the next session. And thank you, audience, for your participation. Look forward to any questions. I think our panel are, are available over coffee here for the next 24 hours, at least for the awards this evening. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>